Thank you. Welcome again to Family Bible Study. We are continuing very patiently to listen to what God has to tell us from His Holy Word, particularly as we're looking at chapter 10 of Jeremiah. Now we're going to go on to verse 23. O Lord, and remember it's Jehovah again uh, that we're reading here, four letters of Lord being capitalized, indicating it's Jehovah. O Jehovah, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. You see... A man is absolutely not trustworthy. We are sold out under sin. The word direct here actually is a word that normally is translated to prepare or once in a while to establish. It's a fairly common word. A very good verse that uh, that really identifies with this and helps us to understand it is is Psalm chapter 10, Psalm 10 verse 17. Psalm 10, verse 17, where we find the same word used as the word direct, and it, uh, it, it'll it help us to understand this verse also. Psalm 10, verse 17. Lord, thou, that is Jehovah, thou hast heard the desire of the humble, thou wilt prepare their heart, thou wilt cause thine heart ear to hear. Now this word prepare, thou wilt prepare thine their uh, their heart. That is exactly the same word as direct here in Jeremiah chapter 10. Uh, and you see it is God who has to prepare us so that and and the it is a word that not only uh, it's in uh, used in some places to establish uh, and it is to and so that when we get the full nuance of this word, it really is signifying to prepare for eternal establishment. You uh, only God can do this, and this is what Psalm 10 is saying: Lord, Thou hast heard the desire of the humble; Thou wilt prepare their heart. My, when we come to God with a broken and a contrite heart. Can we take credit for that, that God finally has broken us down and now we are fully recognizing that we're sinners and that we don't deserve salvation and and we've actually come to a point where we are hanging our whole life on the Lord Jesus. We just trust Him implicitly that He has to do it all. Can we take any credit for it? And the answer is no. He prepares our heart. How does He prepare our heart? Well, he prepares our heart by giving us a new heart, a new heart, a new spirit. He gives us a brand new resurrected soul. He gives us a brand new uh, inner essence. He does all the work of preparing us uh, so that our way is an acceptable way. Uh, It is not in man to, uh, to do it himself. I know that the way of man is not in himself. Now, of course, we can... If we only look at that phrase, we can say, well, sure, everybody has his own way. Everyone, uh, what, what can God be me- saying here? Uh, that every, uh, it is, I know that the way of man is not in himself. But the re- next phrase uh, helps us to understand what God is dr- uh, dr- uh, driving at. I know that the way of man... That is the way of man to walk in a way that he, in which he is, is uh, prepared to be forever established with God is not within man. That's really what the verse is teaching. It is not in man that walketh to direct or to prepare his steps. We must look to God altogether. And this is the hardest, the hardest thing in the world for mankind, because mankind uh, has such a high opinion of himself. He truly believes that he can do it. I can do it. I have been given a good mind. I have a lot of good ideas. I will work this out. And and uh, we want our own credit. We want our own, uh, uh, our own uh, ego to be satisfied, our own self-esteem. 
uh, and we, uh, it, it, the only way, the only way we'll do it God's way is when God breaks us down. And it's very significant that sometimes God has to clobber us off, awful hard as he breaks us down. But uh, that's the wonder of salvation. As the most proud man, the most uh, stubborn, hard-headed individual imaginable can still be broken by God if it's God's good plan to uh, to save that person. But when that person is saved, he's going to be humble. He will uh, he will have been prepared by God. He will be a different man altogether than he was before he was saved. Now here in verse 24, God gives us how He does this work of uh, directing our way or preparing us. How does he do this? Oh, Lord, or, or uh, uh, oh, Lord, correct me, but not, uh, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Years ago, when I didn't understand the word judgment as it's used in the Bible, I thought, now, how can that be? You mean that God has to bring me into judgment and he has to pronounce a, a, a penalty against me and I have to endure that penalty of some kind? Is that the way he corrects me? But once we understand that the word judgment is the word law, it is a synonym for law or precept or statute or commandment or word, then it all fits together. Oh, Lord, correct me. Correct me with thy law. Do you remember 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Let's uh, look at it a second. Because it is so, so very important. All Scripture. What is all Scripture? What is all Scripture? The whole Bible. The whole Bible. Every single verse in the Bible is a part of all Scripture. It is given by inspiration of God. That is, it came from the mouth of God and is profitable for doctrine, that is, for teaching. Yeah, we can learn a lot of things from the Bible, but notice, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You notice the, the emphasis of this? It, is, it, it, it all has to do with, with correction, ultimately, reproof. To be reproof has to do with correction. To be trained in righteousness has to do with correction. Because by nature, are we righteous? Are na by nature, do we are we always ready to do it God's way? The answer is no, no. And so the the huge emphasis of this verse is that God has given us His law. All Scripture is profitable for. Uh, for uh, teaching, but also for correction, for reproof, for tr instruction in righteousness. And this is what is being, uh, what we're pleading here in Jeremiah chapter 10. Oh, Lord, correct me, but with judgment, with thy law, with thy law, correct me, because I, I, I want to go thy way. Now, this is a very interesting place to find this. God has just indicated ugly, ugly, ugly things about those who are in the local congregations, the very nature of the local congregation, that they are under the wrath of God and, and uh, they are, have become a den of dragons. And, oh, my, wouldn't it be wonderful if every pastor, if every Bible teacher... If every individual in all the local congregations throughout the world would would uh, uh, become uneasy about their situation, they somehow things are not the way they really ought to be. There have been so many changes. The families have been destroyed. Uh, they're uh, they're uh, they're uh, we're, we're getting more and more involved in entertainment, and and uh, we've lost our direction. We don't know where we're going as a holy people any longer. Oh, 
Lord, correct us, correct us by thy word. And so all over the world we had groups of people in local congregations earnestly uh, studying the whole Bible once again, really comparing Scripture with Scripture and trying to find truth from the Word of God. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Is it happening? Is it happening? No, not at all. Not at all. Oh, come on now. Uh, we don't need correction. You were doing very well, thank you. Thank you. Look at our beautiful hymns. Look at our... Our, uh, our, uh, our fine pastor, look at how many people are joining up and so on. So we, there's really nothing we have to be concerned about. And, and this, this is almost a plea. It's almost a plea uh, that goes to the winds. It goes nowhere. Oh, Lord, correct me. But, but, but wonderfully, it's still the day of salvation. And there is a remnant chosen by grace. That remnant, uh, that great multitude, finally, because of the, uh, the remnant uh, extending all through the whole world, who do take this seriously, who seriously do listen to the Word of God, praying, Oh, Lord, correct me. Oh, Lord, help me to be more faithful to your word. Oh, Lord, uh, may it be that thou wilt work in me to will and to do of thy good pleasure. And that's the way it ought to be. And that is the, that which identifies with salvation. Now, we uh, the, the, uh, uh, notice the, the plea here, Not in thine anger lest thou bring me to nothing. The word nothing is a little bit stronger than this word as it's used in the Bible. It really means and be brought down to be very small or to be diminished very greatly. Uh, there's no other place in the Bible that I'm aware of that this same Hebrew word is used as nothing, but it is used several places as few or like they were few in number or uh, or to be diminished down very small. The fact is that mankind thinks they're so great, and when we look around, we see all the power and the glory and the glamour of mankind, but in hell they will be diminished down to nothing. They will just be diminished all the way down to nothing. It won't it, it it will not be anything great and wonderful like they have today. It'll be under the they'll be under the wrath of God. But now let's go down to verse twenty five, the next verse, and this is a very very curious verse again. It's a very curious verse because what is the law of God concerning our relationship with our fellow man? What is our relationship to our fellow man? We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And to love our neighbors means we want the highest good for them. And who is our neighbor? Anybody who lives in this world. Now, here are those who are re in rebellion against God. Uh, we're talking about local congregations here. And here comes a statement Pour out thy fury upon the heathen or the nations that know not thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him and consumed him and have made his habitation desolate. Uh, and uh, is this now a cry for vengeance by those of us who have been driven out of the local congregations? Are we praying, O oh God, have Pour out your uh, uh, pour out your anger and venom upon uh, that congregation that excommunicated me because I wouldn't uh, be faithful to the uh, to uh, what they teach. Is that what this is teaching? And we know it cannot be. We cannot be. Absolutely, it cannot be. But this this is an insertion here. This is an insertion here. Uh, like God does from time to time, where God is expressing His vengeance. It's not 
we who have been harmed or feel like we are the victims, uh, uh, that it is, it is God who is expressing what will happen to those who have rebelled against his word. They, God's fury will come on that, on them. This is a given. This is an integral part of the salvation program. This has to happen. And God wants us to be reminded of the fact that even though we have been driven out, even though we have been uh, maligned and, and, and persecuted in the way that it may have happened, uh, the fact is that God's wrath is there. And in fact, it's already there because in verse 22, uh, uh, the, the uh, cities of Judah are already a den of dragons. That is an evidence that God's wrath is there. We who are the true believers are like the Lord Jesus weeping, weeping. How terrible, how terrible. And, oh, God, is it possible that some of these still might become saved? But there is an overriding justice. God's perfect justice demands payment for sin. It won't go away. It is always there. We can pray and pray and pray that God somehow might forgive uh, where uh, uh, the sins of those who are sinning so grievously against God, but God cannot forgive them unless their sins were paid for. And if their sins were paid for, then they have become a child of God, and so they are no longer under the wrath of God. Uh, uh, but if they... If their sins have not been paid for, there is no way out. God's wrath must come on them. And, and uh, uh, notice he not only talks about the nations, the nations that know thee not, that is, those who are, have been outside of the local congregations, but they also, he's also talking about the families that call not on thy name. Uh, uh, it's as if they uh, and that have eaten up Jacob. Tell me, who has been the chief enemy of the true believers as we have come to the end of the church age? Who is the one who, at whose door does the real problem lie insofar as driving out the true believers and making it necessary for them to leave? Is it the world out there? Is it the political world, the social world? The world of, uh, of uh, strange uh, non-biblical uh, religions that have nothing to do with the Bible? No, that's not where it is. It is in the local congregations. They are the families of God or have been the families of God, but they are not calling on the name of God. You know, this, this phrase, uh, that call not on, the name, on thy name, that's not a that's not a common phrase, uh, calling on the name of God. Uh, we find, for example, Abraham. If we go back to Genesis, Genesis chapter thirteen, where Abraham came to Bethel, verse three, and uh, and uh, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. It's language that identifies with anyone who is truly broken before God, who really wants to do it God's way. In the book of Joel, we find a, a beautiful phrase that identifies, like I say, this is not a very common phrase, not nearly as common as we might think we would have find it, but God really does define it in the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse 32, verse 32. And here we find the beautiful statement. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And we could spend a lot of time right with this verse. It is God who calls and... Uh, and those who call on the name, and I want to talk about that name in just a moment, 
But remember, in wasn't it in Acts chapter 2? In Acts chapter 2, if my memory serves me right, don't we find that same phrase there this, uh, in verse 21? In verse 21, And it shall come to pass, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, that, that phrase, call on the name of the Lord, obviously based on Joel 2, verse 32, and, on, and the other two verses we gave, Acts 2 and on Genesis chapter 13, verse 4, has to do with salvation. Absolutely has to do with salvation. But why does it say calling on the name of the Lord? Do we simply mouth uh, the name of God, O oh God, or O oh Jesus, or O oh Lord, or whatever, uh, uh, have mercy on me? Is that calling on the name of the Lord? And the fact is, no, that's not calling on the name of the Lord. First of all, the name means that it's upon God in every aspect of his being, the name of God. Remember when we became become saved, how are we baptized? Into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The name embraces the totality of who God is. To call on the name of God means that we are completely broken before him, and we're looking all together to God, the triune God, as as a Savior. He is the only one who who uh, we can put any trust in, and we will not come to that position until God has saved us, because by nature we're in rebellion against God. There's none that seeketh after him. There has to be the miracle of salvation that comes within us in order that we might begin to call on the name of the Lord. And when it's speaking here in Jeremiah chapter 10 about those who do not call on the name of the Lord, it is, we, could, we could paraphrase this very easily, those who are not saved, those who have never been born again. They claim to be born again. They claim to be saved. They claim a relationship with God, but they are are not saved because they are they are not obeying God, and they are in that in that institution now that has become a den of dragons. Well, next time we're going to go on with uh, chapter. Uh, we're going to go on in uh, and look at cha- begin in chapter eleven.